Okay, it looks like we're recording. So uh, last time we were talking about uh, this first example of what I'm calling a distance problem here. And there's a bunch of versions of distance problems. You know, distance between two points is easy. That's just a formula, right? But how do you find, for example, the distance from a given point to a given line? Or how do you find the distance between two parallel planes? Or how do you find the distance... Oh, but there's various different objects that you could reasonably want to compute distances to other objects. Uh, so this is not a complete list. And again, uh, the, the, the idea here is tools for your toolbox, right? So uh, don't think of this as a list of formulas to memorize. Think of this as a list of tricks to internalize that you can then use as needed depending on the circumstances. Okay, so we talked about this one last time, and the big idea is if you have a uh, point given, and if you have a line given, now wait a second, what does it mean? Well, that's not a good job of, let me try that again. There we go. Uh, if you have a line given, that means that you're given a point and a vector parallel. So th this is all given, right? Um, the idea is that, well, a simple subtraction gives me this w vector, and then a projection gives me this vector, and then the subtraction, orange minus uh, dark blue, purple, dark, no, dark blue, okay, yeah, uh, that difference, that subtraction, is then the thing whose magnitude uh, is the distance that you're looking for, right? So now that's just a clever trick. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, uh, when is this going to be useful? I, I don't know. Uh, the, who knows, right? Again, tool for your toolbox. Um, and the big idea is that uh, a, uh, a projection gives you the parallel part and then a subtraction leaves, remains, only the perpendicular part. Okay. All right. Okay. So now, uh, same question, different tool for your toolbox that, again, could be convenient in different circumstances. Again, it's not about the answer. It's about the tool, right? So this is a really clever one. I don't know if I ever would have thought of this. I certainly didn't on my own. Somebody showed me this, right? But it's very, very clever. Uh, this is an example of a, uh, a strategy, which you might call a mathematical strategy, for how to solve certain kinds of problems. And that is find something that you're not interested in and compute it two different ways, and then hope that those two results together can actually allow you to solve for what you want. So in this case, even though what we're actually interested in is this distance, point to a line again, right? What I'm gonna actually compute here is this area, which again, not what we're interested in. Why am I computing stuff I don't care about, right? Well, okay, so here we go. I'm going to compute it two different ways. On the one hand, uh, <clears throat> the uh, area is height, if you will, times base, if you will, right? And again, this base, well, that's a distance, but it's the magnitude of the projection vector, or you could say it's the component, right? The absolute value of the component. Take a pick. And certainly that gives you area. Cool. Didn't want that. Don't need it. Not clear what we're doing here, right? Okay. Okay. But yeah, that said, still, now I'm going to compute the area a different way. Same area. Uh, I'm going to compute that same area a different way, and that is to observe that, well, look, I can talk about this vector and... Um, uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, let's use this. Uh, no, I already used that color. Sorry. Uh, this vector, right? The projection and the W. And uh, assuming this is in three dimensions anyway, the magnitude of the cross product gives me the area. Right? Um, so, okay, great. I have now successfully computed something I don't care about twice. <laughs> um, okay, so the point to this, the big picture strategy on this is not that we can compute area. The big picture strategy is that having computed something, whether I care about it or not, having computed something two different ways, I know my two answers are the same. 
right? And so uh, now notice the distance that we're interested in right there, easily solved for, boom, we've got a formula. Everybody happy? Really clever. Wish I'd thought of it. Okay, tool for your toolbox. Okay, how do you find the distance between two parallel planes? Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, if they're, if they're horizontal or something, then that might seem like an easy problem, but if they're tilted at some weird angle or something, I mean, it, it, things get a little, a little weird. So uh, this one is surprisingly easy. This is a, a really easy, convenient little trick. If you know the two planes, then you can talk about this difference vector between any point on the one plane and any point on the other plane. Easily computed is B minus A. Again, if you know these planes, presumably you have their equations, thus you have their normal, come on, straight lines, uh, normal vector in. And then you just notice that the distance we want is literally the component of that green vector in the orange direction. Absolute value, you know, I really should put absolute values on that. Because again, distances are intrinsically positive. There we go. Everybody see that? Clever move. So yeah, again, now don't memorize the formula. Remember the trick, right? Think about the the cleverness and uh, the, uh, the you know the the general idea of a tool that this gives us. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Moving along. Um, and this is kind of a weird one. Again, I don't think I would have thought of this one either. Somebody showed me this uh, long, long ago. Uh, if you have two lines, what we call skew lines, which means kind of there's nothing interesting about the relationship between these lines. They don't intersect. They're not parallel. They're just kind of two random, weird, unrelated lines in some sense. How do you find the distance between those two lines? Now, there's a, 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 another question uh, underneath this, which is how would I even define the distance between two lines? Uh, and that's a little bit of a, a thinker. Uh, in particular, I can talk about, well, I could pick a point over here, and I could look at all the distances to all the points on the green line and ask which one of those is the shortest. But how do I know that I picked the right point over here in the first place? Uh, that's, a, that's a bit of a problem. So what you could then say is, all right, well, for any given point, I'm going to talk about what is the shortest distance there to the green line. And then I'm going to do that for every point down here on L2. And one of them the shortest distance, whatever it is, will be shorter than any of the others, than any of the other shortest distances, right? So you got to be a little bit careful even figuring out what the question is asking. So uh, the, uh, the clever way of looking at this, again, I wish I thought of this, I did not, uh, is to uh, uh, notice that if you have two skew lines, they have direction vectors. If they're not parallel, because they're skew, then these uh, you can cross and find a direction. Let's see here. Uh, that's perpendicular to both. You can use that then to define what we're going to call a normal vector. And you can ask, OK, well, what is the equation of a plane containing the first line? And then what is the plane containing the second line. So these are the same lines that we were looking at before. And having made this observation, and by the way, already a pretty weird observation, whenever you have two skew lines, you can always find, by this method, you can find a pair of parallel planes containing the lines. This is a little not obvious that that can be done, but again, there you go. That's how you do it, right? And then so clever observation is that uh, this shortest distance that we're looking for from the one line to the other line is also the distance between those two planes. So there you go. 
And we already know how to find the distance between two planes. Uh, let's see, let me uh, zoom back out. Uh, that distance between two planes, existing formula. So again, really clever. Tool for your toolbox. Who knows when that might be useful. Everybody with me? Everybody happy? Okay. All right. So uh, that's it for lines and planes. We're going to move on now to section 1.7. Um, <clears throat> new coordinate systems. So uh, I want to talk first about our existing usual coordinate system, and that is what we call rectangular coordinates. Uh, we're so accustomed to it, it almost seems like it's not something that needs to be defined. It's just what is, right? But that's not the case, right? It is it is an arbitrary uh, system, uh, you know, way of thinking, I suppose, and so we need to be precise about what it is and uh, what we're assuming about how it works. So uh, rectangular coordinates, um, probably no surprise, but for any point in the plane, we'll start in R2, right? For any point in the plane, we define the x and y coordinates like this, and uh, a lot of people would say that uh, that we're dropping perpendiculars. Uh, Y'all have had a linear algebra class. Y'all know about coordinates with respect to an arbitrary non-orthogonal basis. And uh, technically, these are not <coughs> dropping perpendiculars, except that in this case, these uh, standard basis vectors are literally orthogonal. And so, in fact, the the uh, whole coordinate thing is the same as the um, as the uh, component thing. So here, coincidentally. I can think of this as dropping perpendiculars. And specifically, that gives me a well-defined, unique value of x and a unique value of y. By the way, another little mathematician um, sort of shorthand exclamation point usually means unique. Um, so that means that my coordinates, x, y, are unique for any given point there is a unique set of x and y coordinates. Yeah? <coughs> well, of course. I mean, why are we even bothering to say this? And the reason we're bothering to say it is because as much as this is obvious and that we're accustomed to it and we take it for granted, yeah, it's not true with other coordinate systems. So this is something we're going to have to let go of, right? And I just want to prepare you all, right? Have to go on and talk about new coordinate systems. Be prepared for this not to work anymore. Um, and then likewise, there's certain other conveniences that are just, uh, we just take for granted. Um, <clears throat> as specifically, if you have coordinates x and y, those coordinates themselves are the coefficients in a linear combination of the standard basis vectors. Now again, from a math to 18 coordinates with respect to a basis point of view, this is actually the definition. But again, if we, you know, take advantage of the fact that this is a right angle and standard basis vectors are awesome, um, we can define by projections, uh, excuse me, by, uh, yeah, uh, by components, and then this is a new and meaningful statement about coordinates. So, cool, uh, pretty handy, nice, and a related fact uh, any two vectors, if you do a linear combination of any two vectors, you are perfectly entitled to just do that same linear combination one coordinate at a time. That's how you compute a linear combination of vectors. Again, we, we're accustomed to this. We take this for granted, and it doesn't work for any of our new coordinate systems we're about to see. So, again, this is a list of things that we're going to have to let go and uh, unaccustom ourselves to. All right, so here we go with our first coordinate system, polar coordinates. A lot of y'all may have seen polar coordinates before. Um, yeah, you know, picture, boom, there it is, <laughs> I suppose. Um, I want to encourage y'all, though, to think a little bit differently about polar coordinates. This is going to be really useful a little bit later on once we start doing a certain kind of integration technique. And that is to think of polar coordinates as relating to a function, and this function takes uh, input values, r and theta, and produces output values, uh, x and y. Right? So given an r and a theta, I need to tell you then how do we produce this output point, uh, 
x comma y, and uh, again, it's exactly what you uh, are previously accustomed to. So specifically, uh, theta is just telling you how far to go counterclockwise around the origin from, you know, starting from the positive part of the x-axis. It's the usual, exactly what you're accustomed to. And now I'm about to commit a math crime. Apologies, but it's just easier to commit the crime and apologize later than to, you know, anything else. So here we go. I'm going to commit a math crime. I'm going to say R is the distance that you go in the direction indicated by theta. Okay, now technically, okay, it's not a distance. Distance is a loaded word. Distance is an intrinsically positive thing, right? And R is not intrinsically positive. There's really nothing wrong with R being negative. And if R is negative, no problem. Um, if, you, uh, if you have a negative value of R, you just go backwards. So just, you know, like that. Okay, so positive R's go that way, negative R's go this way. No reason we can't do that. Yep? What does the G key in the, like, above the address? Oh, uh, G is the name of the function that I'm about to, that I'm in the process of defining that, that takes input coordinates r and theta and produces output coordinates x and y. Okay. And I'm going to write down the formula for this in a second. The reason I have p as a subscript is because this is a function describing polar coordinates. And so the p is for polar. Okay. Yeah. And I will momentarily have a, uh, uh, a well, okay, in, in, in a few minutes I'll have a, uh, a different g that will describe a different coordinate system. Okay. Yeah. And another yeah. question? Uh -huh. It might be like not very relevant, but like is it kind of similar to the like change of phases from beginning of the like this change of coordinates? I mean, there there's some connections. Uh, the big difference is that change of basis is still talking strictly and only about linear combinations, right? And here, this is a you can see there's a kind of a curviness to this, right? And so this is a more flexible thing. And, uh, and, and also, you know, we want to do it only in a very limited set of ways. There's really only three non-rectangular coordinate systems that we're going to talk about at all. Whereas change of basis, well, I mean, any basis, you can do a change of basis, right? And so this, it, it's different, but it's, yeah, there are some things in common. Yeah. Okay. So don't forget R is allowed to be negative, at least for the moment. We'll revisit that decision later when we have just cause. Oh, a little bit of trig. I'm going to leave this as an exercise for y'all. This is a pretty easy flashback um, that uh, <clears throat> x and y relate to r and theta by way of this triangle and um, trig. And so make, just make sure you're good with that. Again, I assume y'all are proficient with trig, and uh, that's uh, this is the resulting relationship. And thus, this then is our formula for our function, this g function takes in an r and a theta and produces an x and a y, like so. If that's the formula. Make sure you know these formulas. Okay. All right. So now let's worry about problems. <laughs> um, again, I, I uh, already kind of foreshadowed this, but they're not unique. This point right here in the xy plane, it's got a unique x and it has a unique y, but... Uh, I can talk about this angle, theta, and I can talk about this magnitude, which as I was writing these notes, apparently I decided would be 5, whatever. So I could say that uh, this point here in the R theta plane hits that point xy in the xy plane. Or said differently, I could say that these are the polar coordinates for that point. Fine. Yeah, sure. But here's the nasty little point. Uh, if I add 2 pi to the angle, I mean, geometrically, in the xy plane, what does it mean to add 2 pi? It just means that I'm going to kind of go around a full turn. And if you've already got theta at a value that points that way, if you go around a full turn, you still point in the same direction, right? So these coordinates over here, with theta now being, let me say it differently, with the, with the angle coordinate being 2 pi greater than it had been, 
that point goes there too. Everybody okay with that? So, oh well, so much for uniqueness of coordinates, right? This is not, not a thing in polar coordinates. And of course, you can also go around again and again, and as many integer number of times as you want. Right? So there are infinitely many polar coordinates for a given uh, set of rectangular coordinates. And it's worse than that because, let me uh, clean up my picture here, um, adding 2 pi is not the only thing I could do here. I could say, well, what if I just add pi? If I add pi, I'm going around a half turn. That gets me going in exactly the wrong direction. And again, don't forget, just because you're going the wrong direction doesn't mean you have to actually go in that direction because r could be negative, which would get you right back to the exact same point. So, uh, whoops. Uh, so, uh, let's see here. I'll use yellow, I guess. Uh, negative 5 get you to the same point there. And then having done that half turn, you can make more <coughs> full turns as many times as you want, right? So there's actually a lot, there's doubly infinite many different ways to write down polar coordinates. So be aware of all these little uglinesses uh, and uh, be aware that if you uh, find polar coordinates for a point and your friend finds polar coordinates for a point, you might get different polar coordinates and that's okay. Okay, a uh, little term of sloppiness. Um, just be careful with your notation. If you write down something like uh, 2 comma pi over 6, uh, and if polar coordinates are, I'm going to say, in play, in you know, whatever it is that you're doing, just be aware that now that's, that's ambiguous. Is that x equals 2, y equals 6? Right? There's a perfectly good point there. There's no reason that the y coordinate can't be this value, pi over 6. I know it looks like an angle, but it's also a perfectly legitimate real number, right? And so th that is, in fact, a point. But then there's also, uh, we could ask, uh, well, maybe uh, r is 2 and theta is pi over 6. That also is a perfectly good point and a different point. Right, so just be, uh, just be aware that this is, this is tragically uh, ambiguous. You can remove the ambiguity by just explicitly saying what you mean, right? And so here I would say r comma theta equals 2 comma pi over 6. Boom, now I know what you mean. Ambiguity removed. And uh, look how easy it was to, to be uh, explicit. Does that make sense? Okay, now here's a landmine. A lot of students get stung on this. This is uh, more subtle than it looks. A um, <clears throat> little bit of trig and geometry uh, gives you these formulas. Right? No sweat. Pythagorean, Pythagorean relationship and then the, uh, the uh, trig of uh, tangent of that angle. And so hey, easy formulas to write down. What a lot of students want to do is then solve for r or solve for theta. But you can't. If you have solved for something, you're saying that is the only possible value for it. And as we just discussed, there is no single possible value. There is no uniqueness. Right, of polar coordinates. So I think it's really dangerous to uh, write down equations that where you would have your reader believe you have solved for these things because you might accidentally believe your own nonsense, right? <laughs> and uh, <coughs> oh, excuse me, uh, and uh, then that'll get you to wrong answers. So an easy example of this. Uh, let's suppose we were to solve. Uh, right and uh, solve for r and this. Oh, by the way, in reference to a, a particular point, let's suppose I'm talking about this point right here, x y negative one negative one, perfectly innocent little point there in the x y plane. And now we will solve for r, and r becomes, you know, casually, sloppily, 
Square root of 2. Fine. No problem. And then let's see here. I need to uh, solve for theta. Okay, well, that's going to be arctan of 1. Okay, so pi over 4. <coughs> cool. Uh, sure, fine, plus any number of full turns, right, whatever. And here's the problem. This thing that I've just written down sloppily and carelessly, that, I mean, look at it. Theta, pi over 4. And r equals square root of 2 puts me there, which is wrong. Anybody see what happened? Now, I didn't have to manufacture some crazy weird example to show how this, you know, uh, carelessness can lead to problems. These are really boring points, <laughs> right? And wrong, right? So this is a nasty little landmine. Don't step on that landmine. Let me show you instead what I would like you to do. Um, <clears throat> and that is to uh, use these formulas to give yourself some candidates, right? So what this really tells you is that R could be either of these values, and I don't know which, or could it be either? Is it that it's one of these and I just don't know yet? Or is it that it could literally be either one? <laughs> yet to be determined, right? But I do know it can't be anything other than those two values. Fine. Uh, likewise, I can use this and think about all the possible values of theta for whom tangent is 1, as, as it works out in the arithmetic in this case. Uh, and I get, uh, again, there's a bunch of different values. It's not just the plus 2 pi uh, n thing. There's pi over 4, but there's also 5 pi over 4. And then look at the geometry. Right? So don't try to make formulas that will do this work for you. you I, I'm a big believer you really need to see the geometry um, and then just kind of pick appropriately. So, for example, I could, I suppose, uh, decide, okay, look, at this point, come on, I want to clearly want to think of this as being in that direction, and that angle is pi over, uh, excuse me, 5 pi over 4. So I'm going to say that that... 5 pi over 4 is the angle I'm going to choose. And okay, having to decided that I'm going in that direction, is my r here positive or negative? Which one do I want? Do I want positive or negative? And again, picture tells the story, right? I can just see right here that I clearly apparently want to go in the positive direction here, right? So of these two possible values for r, and these two possible sets of values for theta, it's the sort of unexpected, uh, what you might call the off pair, that actually puts you uh, where you're supposed to be. Anybody see that? So again, uh, if you're uh, just uh, too, too casual about this, you're going to get some wrong answers. But again, just look at the geometry. It's right there in front. Oh, and of course, you can also, perfectly valid, uh, view this instead as being uh, in that direction, pi over 4. And in that direction, I go backwards, namely a negative value of r. Right? So that, too, is a perfectly valid set of polar coordinates for that point. Everybody with me? Okay. Okay, equations and polar coordinates. Um, again, there's a bunch of different kind of little uh, oh, little tricks to have thought through once. I'm going to be really quick with these. These are pretty straightforward. It's just a little algebra and a couple of landmines that I need to point out. But um, So uh, how would I make sense out of this equation right here, r equals 3? Well, I can think geometrically in this case, r being distance from the origin, and I can say distance because it is positive here. It says so, right? So this just literally says points in the xy plane whose distance from the origin is 3, and that's pretty clearly a circle. Now we got lucky there. The geometry of this equation just happened to be obvious. It usually won't be. Right? But uh, So let's pretend that we had not noticed that. How else would I interpret what this is? And uh, clever trick, if you square both sides, the left turns into something that I can convert into x's and y's 
directly out of a conversion formula. Clever move. Okay. And then, of course, we can look at this equation right here and say, oh, yeah, Algebra 2 class from high school, that's a circle, boom. And so we get the same answer that we already do in this case. But the point is, is there was a, an algebraic process uh, to lead to that answer that didn't rely on geometric intuition. So that's a nice little trick. Um, different trick works here. Theta equals pi over 3. Now, again, you can think geometrically about that. <coughs> And then remembering as well that R is allowed to be negative, you can say, all right, well, it's this whole line. Sure, it's totally fine. But if you didn't notice that, different trick here, take the tangent of both sides. Point being that then the left side turns into something for which I have a pre-existing conversion formula. Tan theta is y over x. So, yeah, again, you know, again, a convenient thing. Y, y equals constant times x, we already know, is a straight line through the origin. Everybody happy? Okay. By the way, if it's too cold in here, you can mess with the thermostat right there. Feel free. Or you can try to persuade him to do it. If you have <laughs> okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> okay, here's another one. Now, this one's harder. And this one, it's really, really hard to just kind of look and see an obvious relationship between r and theta and just intuit the picture. Don't try. Right. But uh, here what we can do is kind of, roughly speaking, do a point plotting exercise. right? And so I'm just going to pretty much just start plotting points. Um, I'm going to start by thinking about a range of values of theta, 0 to pi over 2. There are those values of theta from 0 to pi over 2. And uh, let's see here, having decided on that, let's think about what, uh, what's really going on there. Am I taking sine of theta? Unfortunately, no. Theta is not the argument of the sine function. The thing that goes into the sine function is 2 theta. So as theta goes from 0 to pi over 2, as I cover these angles right here, r, and therefore formula for R, right? Sine is going to, uh, the argument for sine is going to go through from zero to pi. And so if you ask, well, what's the range of values then? What's happening to R? What's happening to sine of two theta as the argument of sine goes from zero to pi? Well, it's starting at zero and then it's increasing and then it's decreasing and going back down to zero. And so this is basically a little prescription. As your theta goes from 0 to pi over 2, our distance from the origin, as we sort of turn, if you will, a quarter turn here, my r needs to start off at 0. As I turn, my distances need to increase and then decrease and come back down to 0. And so you can see this, uh, this, if you will, that curve is doing like that. Anybody see how I broke that down? Okay. And then you can continue. Let's uh, let's take the next sort of um, <clears throat> the next chunk of values of theta. Um, cleaning up my mess first. Uh, let's think about what happens when theta goes from pi over two to pi. And again, you know, sadly, we've got to keep track of the fact that theta is not what we're taking sine of. We're still taking sine of 2 theta, which means my argument for sine, the thing that indicates which part of a sine wave I'm actually interested in, right? It's, it goes from pi to 2 pi. And as the argument goes from pi to 2 pi, uh, these values of sine start at zero, go negative, and then back up to zero. So now this is a little bit of a weird one. As my angles are starting at pi over two, and then moving in the usual counterclockwise way until I get over to pi, my, my uh, r's are gonna be negative. 
Again, they start at zero, they get down to negative one, and they go back up to zero. And so you just kind of got to go uh, one bit at a time. I start off going that way, but negative distances, uh, you know what I mean, negative coordinates, not negative distances. Um, and then as I, as my direction goes more and more like that, I get over to negative one, and then as I continue to turn, I come back down to zero. And so again, I trace out, right, this business right there kind of traces out something like that. So it's basically point plotting. It's just point plotting sort of one collection of values at a time. And <clears throat> you can uh, keep going. And I think this is a wonderful exercise. I encourage you to do this. Uh, what happens here, it uh, goes around like this. And then it goes around like this. Right? We've already talked through all of that. And now as it continues, as you think through what happens in the other values of uh of theta, it's going to do kind of like this, and then like this, and then go back into the origin. So it makes a little four-leaf clover. Kind of cool. Everybody see it? So again, exercise. Want to think that through? Look, make sure that you can come to that conclusion on your. I mean, it's it's a it's pretty easy to buy. I mean, geometrically, you kind of see a pattern forming, but I think it's a very healthy exercise to think it through, like we did the first two quadrants. Okay. All right. Okay. A uh, couple more sort of algebraic examples. Um, what is this? Uh, here, there's a different sort of algebraic clever move. It's tempting to see this R right here and think, oh, I remember that, that R. We, I, I saw one earlier where you square both sides because R then turns into R squared, which I then know how to do something with. The problem is if you were to square both sides, cosine would turn into cosine squared, and I don't know what to do with that. That's not sort of rectangular convenient. So the slightly different trick here, just multiply both sides by r. You still get the r squared that you wanted, right? But then you also get r cosine theta on the right, which is also convenient rectangularly, right? So again, slick move. I didn't think of this. Somebody showed me this um, and uh, tool for your toolbox and all that. And now you just have to figure out what this equation is, and that's, this is an old Algebra 2 problem. Um, by the way, I am aware that uh, a lot of students have either forgotten or become very rusty or possibly might never have been taught in the first place how to do what's called completing the square. Uh, in my own high school, it was pretty de-emphasized. Um, as if, well, you don't need you don't need to know that. You can just use the quadratic equation. We're not always just looking for roots of things, right? So the quadratic equation does not make completing the square useless. Here's a great example. The quadratic <coughs> equation would not help you here. So make sure you're good with completing the square. Again, as always, um, if you are not sure where to go with that, come to office hours. I'll be very happy to walk you through it and give you a little quick tutorial on uh, how completing the square works anytime. Just come on by office hours. Okay. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this one goes the other direction. Uh, in the last example, we started with polar and we worked our way to rectangular. Here we're going to do the opposite. Here we're going to start with rectangular and work our way to polar. Uh, and this one happens to be quite a bit easier. Uh, these you, to a large extent, kind of just plug in. And so, for example, you'll notice what I did here. Uh, y is just r sine theta. Right, so you just plug in these existing conversion formulas for x and y and do some uh, do some little bit of algebra. Now the slick move here that I, I didn't have to do, you'll notice I could have plugged in first thing. I could have plugged in for this x right here, I could have plugged in x equals r cosine theta, and I didn't, right? Because again, I, I somebody showed me this clever trick uh, who knows how many years ago. Oh yeah, I really don't want to think about that. But uh, if you don't plug in immediately, if you square 
uh, let's see here. Uh, if you square out this second term first, right, go ahead and get all your terms fully expanded, then what you notice is that uh, there is a convenient little freebie that allows me to avoid some tree. I, I would have gotten the same answer if I'd done this sort of the brute force way, but here I cleverly avoid a little bit of trig followed by a Pythagorean identity that would get me to the exact same result. Okay. Everybody good? Okay. okay, next coordinate system, cylindrical <laughs> coordinates. Uh, good news, it's a lot like polar coordinates. It is in fact specifically that uh, for any given point, in space, now we're in three dimensions now, you'll notice. Any given point in space, you look down at the projection into the xy plane, and you look at the projection over to the z-axis, and, well, what you get in the xy plane, you literally just write down polar coordinates for that projection in the xy plane. <laughs> right, so very familiar, good news, not that hard. Uh, and then, of course, uh, now in the Z direction, you just keep the Z, as you can see right there. So uh, pretty boring in the, uh, in the Z direction. And it's basically polar coordinates in the X and Y direction. So, by the way, a lot of people will call cylindrical coordinates polar coordinates in space or polar coordinates in R3. And I think that's... Uh, reasonable, I suppose. I like that better as a way of thinking about it. When it comes to terminology, um, I think it's simpler just to say cylindrical coordinates because it's literally a different coordinate system. Things that are different should have different names. It's just one of my things, right? And uh, so cylindrical coordinates unambiguously distinguishes it from, from the two-dimensional polar coordinates, even though they're very closely related. Okay. Uh, so, with all that in mind, a couple of uh, nice, easy observations. Uh, let's see here. Starting with this one right here, R equals a constant. You can probably persuade yourself that that gives you a cylinder. Theta can be any value, so it goes all the way around. Z can be any value, so it goes up and down. That just kind of traces out a cylinder. Thus the name, by the way, cylindrical coordinates. Plausible. Okay. Um, here's a uh, slightly harder one. Um, <clears throat> this is a sphere. Now let's think about why that's a sphere. Um, I argue with some geometry. You can persuade yourself that what I have on the left here is the square of the distance from the origin. So this equation that I have up here, you can think of as distance equals C. And if distance from the origin is a constant, well, then you've got a sphere. Right? Everybody buy it? Okay, so there's a sphere. How would I write that in cylindrical coordinates? Well, I'm going to convert using this equation right there. And here we go. This is a cylindrical equation. I'll call this a cylindrical equation because all of the variables in this equation are literally cylindrical coordinates. There's no x's in that orange equation. No x's, no y's, right? It's just r's, thetas, and z's. It's a really nice cylindrical equation because it doesn't even have any thetas in it, <laughs> right? But that's okay. All right. Everybody happy? All right, here's a tricky one. Another nice uh, fact in this. Here is a cylindrical equation. Again, no coordinates in that equation that aren't cylindrical. You'll notice, though, again, theta is missing. There are no thetas in this equation. And let me, here's my take on that then. The fact that theta is missing means that theta could be anything and it makes no difference. Let me say that a little bit differently. You can look in any half plane defined by a given value of theta. And the intersection's always going to be the same because what theta is doesn't matter because it's not in the equation, right? And so what this means is all of these 
theta cross sections, you might call them, they all look exactly the same. And I argue that that means that this is a rotation. Right, so now you can see what the picture is uh, for, you know, um, uh, the way I write my notes, uh, the picture's already there. But uh, without looking at that picture, I argue that the mere fact that theta is missing immediately tells me that my shape is a rotation. And so to understand what it is, I can just uh, look at any one of these cross sections. Uh, and uh, here's here's a cross section, I suppose. Right? And Z equals KR, well, that's pretty easy to understand. Uh, let's see here, Z equals KR is, okay, fine. Z axis, R axis, there's Z equals KR. And my surface is just a rotation of that. And so that takes me around and makes a cone. Everybody happy? All right, now let's address uh, sloppiness of the way I wrote this. Uh, I was thinking of theta as representing a half plane because we tend to think of, you know, once you've picked a theta, that tells you which sort of direction you're going out of the origin. But remember, r can be negative. In fact, it is perfectly fine to extend this in the what you might call the negative r direction, right? Which means really we've got not just this orange line here, right? But we also have this red line down here. And so that gets rotated too. And thus when we say cone, we actually get what you might call a full cone. Some people would call this a double cone. I, well, to me, this is just a full cone, not a half cone. Terminology and all that. So uh, yeah. Everybody okay with that, too? All right. Okay. Uh, do be careful about one thing. Um, <clears throat> polar coordinates and cylindrical coordinates both make significant and specific use of that letter R. Right? So R is now kind of, I'm going to say, spoken for. Right? R now means something. Right? So that said, very often when you're using polar coordinates, there's a, there's a circle in your picture or the, a, a sphere or a cylinder, some round thing of which we'll need to talk about the radius. What are you going to call the radius of a round thing? A lot of people like to use R, but you can't. Right? R is now a variable. It's a coordinate. And so you got to be careful in the same way that if you have some arbitrary distance somewhere, you can't just decide to call that x. X is a coordinate, right? So you think of a different name for your distance, right? Maybe d. Why not, right? But you can't call it x. X is a coordinate. And likewise, radii, you can't use this letter r anymore. So uh, do be careful about that. Now I'll point out some options. Uh, Oh, uh, hang on. Let me get my pencil. Here we go. Um, capital R. Perfectly fine. Um, R naught. Little subscript of zero. Perfectly fine. Some people like to get fancy and do like R tilde or, um, you know, uh, R prime. Or, you know, you can do that too, I suppose. Um, but uh, so I'm going to say fine. But just anyway. <laughs> There's a case to be made to get more creative and use as your radii things like A and B, <laughs> right? Also, uh, less confusion because it doesn't look as much like R that we're trying to avoid. All right, so again, heads up, don't inadvertently confuse your variables. That will make your, your work crash and burn. Okay, spherical coordinates. Um, by the way, also, sometimes, I think inappropriately, referred to as polar coordinates in R3, or polar coordinates in space. I think that's a mistake. If anything, polar coordinates in space is cylindrical coordinates, right? It's a lot closer. This is more different, so I discourage uh, that point of view. Uh, so let's see here. Oh, oh, this class ends at 1110, doesn't it? 
Ah, right, fine. Okay, so we'll draw the line right here. We don't, we don't need to use the last three seconds. Um, <laughs> y'all have a good weekend. See you on Monday.